Today, it's the origin story of an unrivaled rock band that was actually this close to never happening. At least not with the legendary lineup that we've all come to revere. Rising from the ashes of another historic band, a young guitar virtuoso dreamed of assembling the ultimate rock powerhouse. The only catch was, uh, with a tour already booked, he only had a month to do this. Now he just needed to recruit three prodigies who could help him alter the sonic landscape of rock and roll forever. I tell you, it's a great rock and roll caper. It's like the Ocean's Eleven of rock. And the world really needed it to happen, especially when they were mourning the breakup of another great band. The story of destiny and their magical first song is coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey Music Junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you have ever studied the liner notes of all of your favorite albums, you know, who plays every single instrument, who produced the album, all that good stuff, this is your channel. Make sure that you subscribe below right now, click the big red button, and uh, click that little bell thing so you always know when our new interviews are coming out. We have some great ones coming out. The stories from the legends of rock and roll. We have a Patreon as well. There you're going to find more content, and we also have a Vintage Years collection that's right below. It's where we celebrate a great year in pop music with characters of all the artists by uh, famed rap fink artist Thomas Estrada. So I'm excited to return to another one of my favorite shows that we do on this channel. It's been a little while since we've done it. It's called Breakthrough. In this show, we break down songs, albums, or events that kicked open the door to an artist or band's career, and you gave them that momentum to rocket to long-term success. Previous episodes, we covered The Joker by Steve Miller Band. I'm a joker, I'm a smoker, I'm a midnight toe. Bang a gong, get it on by T-Rex. Get it on, bang a gong, get it on. But today we're gonna cover the origin story of the great, the mighty uh, Led Zeppelin and the song that kicked it all off for this band, Good Times, Bad Times. Good times, bad times, you know I the story of Led Zeppelin actually begins with an entirely different high-flying band from the 60s, as many of you know, the Yardbirds. Or to be more precise, the quick-fire dissolution of the Yardbirds. So by July of 68, the storied five-album band was all but done following the departure of vocalist Keith Ralph and drummer Jim McCarty. By August of 68, Jimmy Page was the last man standing with bassist Chris Dray uh, on the fence. But Page had a plan to assemble a new incarnation of the group called the New York Birds, with the help of manager Peter Grant. Even before the Yardbirds folded, uh, Page had imagined what his dream band would look like exactly. Said Page, I knew exactly the style I was after and the sort of musicians I wanted to play with, the sort of powerhouse sound I was really going for. Uh, Jimmy Page envisioned a trio of instrumental prodigies. A man on guitar, another on bass, and one on drums. Added to that, he wanted a fourth member, a singer whose voice could rise over the roar of the instruments and could command center stage. Page was really obsessed with finding this last component. And he was convinced that after finding the right voice, everything else would really fall into place. In Jimmy Page's mind, Stevie Winwood or Steve Marriott, they could have been a pretty good fit. But, you know, Stevie Winwood had gone from the Spencer Davis group to Traffic. Sometimes you feel like you've been hired. And Marriott had landed in Humble Pie with Peter Frampton. So Jimmy reached out to another vocalist, a guy named Terry Reed. Paige had been impressed with Reed, who had been the opening act when the Yardbirds had toured with the Rolling Stones. I'd love to give it a shot, Reed told Jimmy after hearing his proposal, but I'm just going to pop off and do this tour first. Yeah, but Jimmy Page was very firm. No, that will not work. I'm putting this group together now. Either do it or not. Now, Reed was reluctant because he had already committed to go on the road for two tours with the Rolling Stones and another with Cream. Reed suggested if he were compensated and if Page would call Keith Richards to explain why Reed wouldn't be touring, you know, maybe it could work. This is pretty funny. Reed said, you know, Keith, he'll probably shoot you in the leg. Oh, no, I'm not going to do that, said Jimmy. That was the end of it. 
Still, Reed played a key role in the formation of the New Yardbirds and the destiny of one Led Zeppelin. That's because before he left with the Stones, he did some small gigs along with uh, an unknown group called the Band of Joy. And it just so happened that two of Band of Joy's members were none other than Robert Plant and John Bonham. As Reed remembered it, the lead singer Robert Plant was singing along with all the guitar licks and I thought, I'll bet someone like Pagey could keep him busy. And in Reed's estimation, that drummer was a tough and crazy lad. Reed remembered Bonzo was bothering some guy's wife and a big fight broke out. Uh, the husband threw a chair, the drummer ducked, and it went through a window. Band of Joy had to play that gig five times to pay for that. <laughs> when Reed saw Peter Grant, he told him he'd found Paige's band. Only he didn't have contact information for either of these guys. A lot of people knew him, you know, Reed would recall, but nobody could find him. Peter Grant, however, tracked down an address for Robert Plant and he sent him a telegram. It read, Priority, Robert Plant, tried phoning you several times. Please call if you are interested in joining the Yardbirds. Peter Grant. You know, but thinking it was a prank, Plant ignored it completely. However, one day after leaving Grant's office, Terry Reed practically walked right into Robert Plant crossing the street. Turns out that uh, Robert Plant was in London cutting a demo. I got something I need to talk to you about, is what Reed would say. Let's go and have a beer. That's how it all started. On July 20th, 1968, Jimmy Page, Chris Dray, and Peter Grant went to Birmingham to hear Robert Plant sing. Robert was performing at a teacher's training college to an almost non-existent audience, if you can imagine that. But as soon as Jimmy Page heard Robert Plant's voice, he knew this was exactly who he was looking for, what he'd been waiting for his whole life. When the two were finally introduced, Jimmy explained his plans and Robert gave Jimmy a demo tape. Listening to it, Page heard the future. Robert's delivery was stirring, and John's drumming was adrenaline-fueled. It sounded like nothing else out there. Jimmy invited Robert to come down and spend some time at his place. Now, as we find out at the band Gel, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. Make sure to build your own pair of glasses the easy way. Just download Zenny's brand new app on your phone. Uh, you can get all the latest deals and easily find the perfect frames for a price that just can't be beat. Download it today, the Zenny app. Okay, so back to it. Jimmy invited Robert down to his place, and there they could go through some records and see if they were on the same wavelength. Said Robert Plant, I looked through his records one day while he was out, and I pulled out a pile to play. Somehow or other, they happened to be the same ones that he was going to play when he got back, and, you know, play to me to see whether I liked him. Yeah, there was no doubt that this was going to work. As the conversation turned to the group that Jimmy was putting together, he told Robert for bass he was leaning towards session extraordinaire John Paul Jones. The Yardbirds bassist Chris Drake uh, had decided not to join. Robert, for his part, was all about Bonzo. He said he'd never seen another drummer come close to his ability. And, of course, Paige was convinced. But as it turns out, John Bonham was not. When Robert Plant caught up with him, he said, Nate, you got to join the Yardbirds. But Bonham already had a steady gig with Tim Rose and was being courted by both Joe Cocker and Chris Farlow. And uh, besides, he said the Yardbirds, they were has-beens. But Jimmy Page would not be denied. I mean, he was this close to getting his dream band off the ground. The New Yardbirds they had a tour coming up just over a month away on September 7th. The old Yardbirds, or what was left of them, were scheduled to tour through Scandinavia, and Page intended to have a band ready to fulfill that particular obligation. So Jimmy and Grant, they took John Bonham out to lunch, and Jimmy spelled out the whole deal. This was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, plus they'd sweeten the deal, you know, giving John Bonham a fixed salary, guaranteeing him a, a nice chunk of change. Uh, Bonham conceded to give it a try, but he reserved the right to bell if it was not a good fit. Those reservations were almost immediately put to rest, though. Uh, the band gelled right away. 
you know, right from the get-go. They completed their outstanding commitment as uh, the new Yardbirds, and after that, they became Led Zeppelin, and the rest, as they say, is history. Led Zeppelin 1 is their first album, will be unofficially known. That was recorded before the band even signed a contract. In fact, Led Zeppelin had only been together, uh, I think, two and a half weeks when they recorded it, with only 15 hours of rehearsals under their belt. They shot over to Scandinavia, and they cut the album just after that. The nine songs on Zeppelin 1 were essentially recorded live as Jimmy was inclined to keep overdubs to a real minimum. That way the band could play the material faithfully on the stage. Describing the album, Jimmy Page called it a mix of acoustic, electric, rock, blues, avant-garde, and experimental music. The approach was completely original. Setting out from the blues, the four musicians took several musical worlds by storm. A psychedelic rock with Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You. Folk with Black Mountain Side. But perhaps most importantly, they pioneered hard rock with Communication Breakdown. Dazed and confused. And today's featured song, Good Times, Bad Times. Good times, bad times, you know I like my chair. Officially, four of the tracks are covers. Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You is by Ann Bredden. You Shook Me by Willie Dixon and J.B. Lenore. You shook me all night long. You shook me all night long. I Can't Quit You, Baby by Dixon Alone. With you, babe. I can't quit you, babe. And uh, Days and Confused was largely inspired by Jake Holmes. I'm Days and Confused, hanging on by a thread. Been Days and Confused for so long, it's not true. The other five, though, are originals, though largely influenced by American blues, as we all know. I also have to mention the iconic album cover. At a time when most pop record sleeves were you know, rainbows, psychedelic color, Led Zeppelin stood out for its colorless simplicity. Maybe it was an obvious choice to have a Zeppelin image on the jacket, but it's striking that Page chose one of the most famously disturbing news photographs in decades for the artwork. The album's cover portrays the Luftschiff Zeppelin 129 Hindenburg as it exploded into flames. Hindenburg was the largest airship ever built by Germany's Zeppelin company. 14 months after its maiden voyage across the Atlantic, the aircraft was destroyed by fire while landing in Lakehurst, New Jersey on May 6th of 1937, and 35 lives were lost. Afterwards, the term going down like a Led Zeppelin not only invoked an embarrassing misfire, but also an event of catastrophic proportions. Of course, the band would change all of that when they burst onto the scene. Led Zeppelin released their historic debut on January 12, 1969. By then, the band was in the midst of a successful U.S. tour. But despite the love Zeppelin was showing America, U.S. critics, and Rolling Stone in particular, they shot the album down in flames. They labeled Jimmy Page a limited producer and a writer of weak, unimaginative songs. Rolling Stone, they had it dead wrong. Wouldn't be the first time. However, back across the pond in the UK, the reviews were more positive. For example, Melody Maker's March 1969 headline read, Jimmy Page triumphs. And Underground Magazine Oz said, few rock musicians in the world could hope to parallel the degree of technical assurance and gutsy emotion that Page displays through the nine tracks. The general public, they also, of course, greeted Led Zeppelin excitedly. The debut album climbed to number six in the UK and it stayed on the charts for 79 weeks. In the US, it rose to number 10. In the years that followed, Zeppelin 1, it's gone uh, platinum, I believe, eight times, probably closer to nine. Worldwide, it sold over 13 million. 
Good Times, Bad Times is the first song on Led Zeppelin's first album, and that's an important distinction. This makes it the official introduction to the band. And it's a fitting start. In hindsight, there may have been no better sonic sequence in the Zeppelin catalog with which to launch their storied career. Good Times, Bad Times, initially called uh, A Man I Know, was written shortly before the start of the sessions for the group's first album. That was about the time the Yardbirds became the New Yardbirds. Three out of the four bandmates are credited as songwriters on the track. There's Page, Bonham, and Jones. Uh, the way Jimmy Page explained it, uh, you know, how it came together, John Paul Jones came up with the riff, I had the chorus, uh, John Bonham applied the bass drum pattern, uh, that one really shaped our writing process. It was like, wow, everybody's erupting all at once. Jimmy Page begins Zeppelin's historic debut with a chord from Page's 59 Telecaster. Within seconds, the song is running really hot. But it's impossible to talk about good times, bad times, without spotlighting John Bonham's mind-blowing work on the drums. Here he achieves a remarkable feat. Not only does he, he lay down a sensational groove from the first few bars, but he also executes a technique called a triplet on his bass drum to achieve a double bass pedal sound. To do this, he used the tip of his toe to flick the bass pedal back fast, creating an effect that more than a few drummers would try to copy throughout the years. Yeah. Jimmy Page explained that good times, bad times came out of a riff with a great deal of John Paul Jones on bass and that it really knocked everybody sideways when they heard the bass drum pattern. Apparently, a lot of people were laying down bets that Bonzo was using two bass drums. As for Jonesy, the bass playing of the former arranger and session musician is nothing short of exceptional. John Paul Jones currently supports the riff. Follows the bass drum like a shadow, delivers several solo phrases, and provides an R&B flavor reminiscent of, of Motown, really. And together, Jones and Bonzo put everybody on notice that they are destined to become an elite rhythm section. Now, a minute and 30 seconds in, Jimmy Page plays a 20-second solo that is reminiscent of his Yardbird days. The solo is a bonafide adrenaline rush. And then, of course, there's Robert Plant. Back in the day, it was through good times, bad times, that the vast majority of listeners discover Robert Plant's voice for the very first time. When the first few words are out of his mouth, you realize that he's on par with the rest of his bandmates. Jimmy would never tire of showering praise on the vocalist. Robert was absolutely extraordinary in those days. He was so bombastic and fearless that neither the songs nor the studio intimidated him. He very quickly got to the point where no other singer could touch him. It's hard to argue with that. From his very first bars, Plant's voice commands total attention. High pitch, energetic, with distinct blues phrasing, you can virtually credit Plant's voice alone for establishing the vocal standard for hard rock and heavy metal bands in the future. Now, lyrically, Good Times, Bad Times has Robert reminiscent about the days of his youth, which with only two decades under his belt weren't that far off. Back then, as it were, he was told about what it means to be a man. But now that he is one, no matter how he tries to do all that he was told, he finds himself in the same old jam. In the chorus, Plant sings that he had his share of both the good and the bad. But what seems to be on his mind is how he lost his girl to a brown-eyed man when he was just 16. Although she was as sweet as can be and she swore she would be all his, 
It was all just hollow promises because it only took a couple of days for her to be rid of him. It only took a couple of days for she was rid of me. Now, the last verse is less formal than the first, almost to the point of sounding improvised. Here, Plant's sense of defeat is conveyed by his admission that he knows what it means to be alone. And he sure wishes he could go back home. Nevertheless, he resolves that he's gonna love her each and every day, and perhaps naively, that they'll never part. Good Times, Bad Times was Led Zeppelin's first US single. On the flip side was another rocker, Communication Breakdown. Incredible combination there. Good Times, Bad Times would chart at number 80 on the Billboard Hot 100 and uh, went to number 66 on the Cashbox chart. In Canada, it went to number 64. and the Netherlands, it went to number 17. Uh, since its release, it's been used in a few different movies, especially in recent years, The Fighter in 2010, uh, it was American Hustle in 2013, and The Atom Project just recently. Good Times, Bad Times has also been covered by an extremely long list of artists. Just a sampling, Elton John, Sheryl Crow, Fish, Ace Frehley, Sammy Hagar, Billy Joel. <laughs> Golden Earring, Randy Jackson, Dave Matthews Bank. Chris Cornell. Aerosmith, Great White, Los Lobos, Beck, Buckethead, Candlebox, The Smithereens, Eddie Van Halen, Eddie Vedder, and Slash, just to name a few. Led Zeppelin coming together, it was destiny. And it's exactly what rock and roll needed, what the world needed. Because you think about it, the Beatles were winding down, privately breaking up the same year Zeppelin released their first album and then officially breaking up in 1970 when Zeppelin had started to overtake American airwaves. It was a true changing of the guard. Some thought they'd never see another band as explosive as the Beatles. And that was quickly proven wrong as Zeppelin would take over the 70s. And Good Times, Bad Times was a phenomenal opening shot. I've always thought of it as the rock version of Attila Tell of Two Cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Good times, bad times with Plant, Page, Bonham, and Jones. It would be a lot more of the former. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Led Zeppelin, first album, and good times, bad times. What do you remember about the song, about uh, the first time you ever heard Led Zeppelin? What does it meant to you, the songs? Let us know in the comments below. If you like this episode, we have a lot more of that came from a lot of Zeppelin episodes. Uh, I'll actually link to them below. Love this band. Uh, if you dig our content, make sure to subscribe below, hit the red button, and check out our merch. We have a lot of great t-shirts, including one that has the characters of uh, Robert Plant on it. And uh, also check us out on Patreon. It's all about keeping the music alive. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.